Hi, this is Michael Autos, and we're back with our discussion of Fundamentals of Clinical Pharmacology, and this is recording part two. We've discussed absorption of drug into the body, distribution and redistribution throughout the body, and some transport. Now we're going to talk about the second half of the process, drug being taken away from the body. And the next step is biotransformation. Biotransformation is really metabolism. It's alteration of a drug by some metabolic process, which usually, but not always, occurs in the liver. Most drugs need to be hydrophilic, that is water-soluble, in order to be excreted out of the body. There are different reactions that the body does in order to accomplish this. We're going to talk first about phase one and phase two reactions. A phase one reaction is something like oxidation, reduction, or hydrolysis. These are all um, chemical processes that increase the polarity of the molecule and make it more water-soluble so the drug can be excreted in the urine. The cytochrome P450 enzyme system is responsible for most of the phase one reactions. Cytochrome P450 system is a very important metabolic set of enzymes. And as patients are ongoing, have ongoing exposure to a certain drug, they can start to get increased activity of this system in response to that exposure. And this can alter metabolism of other medications that are metabolized by the same enzyme subtype. So for example, there's a subtype called the cytochrome P453A4, and there's another one called the cytochrome P453A5. These enzymes are responsible for metabolizing a lot of opioids, benzodiazepines, local anesthetics, and some other drugs. So if a person is chronically exposed to, let's say, benzodiazepines, they may have ramped up activity of this enzyme subtype, and therefore other drugs will be metabolized also more quickly when they get exposed to these drugs. Patients can also have inhibition of their cytochrome P450 system. This might happen when you overload the system and give more than one drug all competing for the same cytochrome P450 subtype. So one example is cimetidine. This is not a drug we use very often anymore, but it's like ranitidine. It's a uh, H2 ag antagonist. And it can inhibit the metabolism of other drugs like meperidine or diaz diazepam and make those drugs seem to have more effect. So those are phase one reactions. We also have phase two reactions where instead of um, putting the molecule through a chemical reaction that oxidates it or reduces it, we conjugate it. We add another polar substance. We attach something like a glucuronate or an acetate group onto the molecule, and that makes it more water-soluble, again, so it can be excreted in the urine. Those are phase one and phase two biotransformation reactions. There are a lot of different polymorphisms, a lot of different genetic var variabilities in patients, in their cytochrome P450 systems and other uh, chemical processes that go on. So one example would be like a pseudocholinesterase deficiency. Those are patients who can't metabolize succinylcholine. And so we can see lots of different patients out there who may not respond normally to a specific drug or class of drugs because of a polymorphism that they have inherited. One last comment about uh, phase one and phase two activities is that babies, specifically neonates up through about one year of age, have diminished phase one and phase two activities. So we may need to adjust dosing for them, not just based on their weight and their body fat, but also on the fact that their metabolic capabilities can be somewhat limited. We said a lot of this happens in the liver. So let's focus on hepatic drug clearance. The word clearance means the volume of blood that the liver could cleanse completely of drug in a given amount of time. Hepatic clearance is the hepatic blood flow times the extraction ratio. What percent of drug can the liver pull out of the blood every time it's exposed? Because we know that most drugs are not 100% cleansed out of the blood the first time they pass through the liver. It's an ongoing process, and each time the liver takes 10% or 60% or 75% of the existing drug out of the bloodstream into the liver, and that is our extraction ratio. So these two variables 
can obviously change, and we need to think about those so we understand how a drug is metabolized in the liver. Hepatic blood flow can vary a lot depending on a patient's cardiac output and their blood pressure. So when cardiac output is low and the liver isn't getting a lot of perfusion, it's going to be harder for the liver to successfully metabolize drugs out of the bloodstream. And then there are some factors that are intrinsic to the drug. So different drugs have different hepatic extraction ratios. What fraction of drug is removed from the blood as it passes through the liver? Well, it turns out that some drugs are more easily extracted by the liver than others. And we have tables, which you don't need to memorize, but you should be aware that we have some drugs that have a very high extraction ratio. Drugs like propofol or fentanyl. These drugs, as much drug is taken out of the blood as possible every time it passes through the liver. And so therefore, the only thing that is limiting metabolism is how fast can you deliver blood to the liver? How much hepatic blood flow can you give? And so we call these flow-limited drugs because of their high extraction ratio. In these patients, hepatic clearance basically is hepatic blood flow. And if you change hepatic blood flow, it's going to change your clearance that much. And if you have a low cardiac output state, patient is hypotensive or in some sort of cardiogenic shock, they're not going to have, they're going to have diminished hepatic elimination as a result. Other drugs have a low extraction ratio. Uh, there aren't a lot of drugs that we use like that, but one common one is rocuronium. So rocuronium is not extracted very well by the liver. It takes several passes of blood before it's able to get out most of the rocuronium. So as a result, if I drop hepatic blood flow, it doesn't really make a difference because the liver is not that efficient at extracting rocuronium out of the blood in the first place. And so hepatic clearance isn't significantly affected by changes in blood flow. Clearance is mostly limited by the fact that the liver can only do so much with the blood that's given to it because it only extracts a small percentage of the drug that's delivered. In these patients, the main concern is how healthy the liver is. And if the liver has uh, changes in its metabolic capacity, if there's some damage to the liver itself, then we're going to see more of an effect on clearance. These are some graphs which you do not need to memorize, but I'd like to go over them very briefly just to drive home the point I was describing a moment ago. This graph shows me liver blood flow in liters per minute and clearance, which is a measure of hepatic metabolism. Here I have a drug in yellow, and as I increase liver blood flow, more drug is metabolized. And it seems sort of infinite. The more liver blood flow I create, the more I get metabolism. And that's great. This is a drug that has a very high extraction ratio, and so it's really flow limited. Compare that with a drug like rocuronium that is poorly extracted by the liver. So obviously, at zero blood flow, I have zero metabolism. But it doesn't take much blood flow before I've sort of maxed out my liver. And I can keep sending more and more blood to the liver. But since the liver is only taking 20% of the drug each time, it doesn't matter how much blood flow I send, I've sort of overwhelmed the metabolic capacity of the liver, regardless of how much blood flow I give. This graph shows a different uh, variable on the x-axis. Here, instead of liver blood flow, we're looking at liver activity. How active are the enzymes in the liver? Again, comparing it to clearance, which is a mark of metabolism. So here's that drug again, that propofol, with a very high extraction ratio, and it's being nicely cleared by the liver. But now, instead of changing liver blood flow, we make the liver sick, and the liver doesn't have as much metabolic capacity. But it doesn't matter because the liver is still pulling tons of drug out of the bloodstream. And until we get to a very, very, very sick liver, the liver will manage to uh, metabolize the drug at pretty much the same clearance, regardless of how active the liver is, whether it has liver disease and the enzymes are inhibited, or whether you've ramped up those enzymes, you've induced them maybe by exposure to some other substance. Here, on the other hand, is, let's say, rocuronium a drug that does not have a very good extraction ratio. When we have liver disease, the little bit of drug that we were able to bring into the liver is now compromised, its metabolism is compromised because of the low liver enzyme activity, because of the liver disease. And so we see metabolism going down. 
On the other hand, since we're only pulling a little bit of drug out of the bloodstream with each pass of blood flow, if we can induce those enzymes, we can get more efficient clearance of the drug from the liver. Again, you don't need to memorize these concepts, but it helps us understand two different concepts, two different variables that affect how a drug is metabolized by the liver. How much blood we're delivering to the liver, and then something intrinsic to each drug, how it's extracted by the liver. The last step for most drugs is the kidneys. Drugs go to the kidneys and are excreted. Many drugs are excreted after they undergo biotransformation, like we've just described. Some drugs can be excreted by the kidney even without being biotransformed, especially drugs that are already pretty water soluble. Now, unlike the liver, where we saw that changing blood pressure and cardiac output changes hepatic blood flow, the kidneys have something called autoregulation, which maintains constant renal blood flow regardless of what your blood pressure or your cardiac output are. Now we'll see that the kidneys get a tremendous amount of blood flow and that's great, but unfortunately clearance of drug is still limited because we said that most drug is bound to proteins and only unbound drugs can be filtered into the kidneys. So we may be delivering a lot of blood full of drug ready to be eliminated, but if it's bound to protein, we're not going to get very much of it into the kidneys. And so instead of just filtering through the glomerulus, as we'll see in our physiology course, we have to have a lot of renal tubular active transporters, a lot of proteins whose job it is to actually grab onto that protein and pump it into the renal cells for elimination. If patients have renal disease or some sort of decreased renal function, we may need to change the dosing of our drugs in order to avoid accumulation of the drug and also of the metabolites. And we should be aware of just some of the drugs that we give that have significant renal excretion. Uh, these include a lot of antibiotics like cephalosporins, penicillins, also vancomycin, um, neostigmine, sugamidex, and several other drugs. That's it for our discussion on metabolism and elimination. We'll continue shortly with the next recording.